Good, e good evening everyone and welcome to the Making More From Sheep webinar series, an AWI and MLA funded initiative. My name is David Brown and I work with the program's New South Wales State Coordinators, Home Sackett, and I'm going to be your webinar host tonight. Our next webinar is going to be held on Wednesday the 12th of April and this webinar focuses on simplifying your RAM selection through the use of ASBVs, indexes and industry RAM benchmarking tools. Before we get started, there's going to be a, a, quick, a quick lesson here on how to use the webinar platform for the uninitiated. Now this control panel that you can see here should be up in the top right hand corner of your screen. Just hit the red button to collapse the control panel and view more of the presentation. Uh, you should be able to hear me, but I can't hear you. Now, that questions box at the bottom of the control panel is essential for tonight. That allows you to type in questions and, and let us know how the, uh, how the rains are falling in your part of the world. So if anyone wants to stick in the weather update from their part there, that'd be great so we know that yeah, it's working and you can hear us. But as the webinar progresses and you've got questions, just jot them in that questions box. Uh, they'll be logged chronologically at my end. And at the end of the webinar, our presenter, Sandy McEachern, has kindly offered to stick around for as long as we need to answer any questions that you may have and that are relevant to your business, your prime land business. Now, a few people writing in there, good rain in northern New South Wales, good to hear. And things are getting greener at Jury, good to hear. Thank you, John. So the Making More From Sheep program an MLA and AWI funded initiative. It's a great uh, great resource for producers, for sheep producers. And if you go on to the Making More From Sheep website, you'll see this homepage. Tonight's webinar, uh, a prime lamb uh, industry benchmark update, will, uh, will fall under the category of Module 1 planning. So if you go in there and have a look at Module 1, there'll be a range of resources and tools available to prime land producers um, to follow up on tonight, the content of tonight's webinar. So our presenter tonight is Sandy McEachern. Sandy is the principal consultant of Home Sackett. Sandy has a long history with agriculture and still runs his own farming business. Sandy joined the Home Sackett team as a consultant in 2002 and in 2007, he became a co-director with John Francis. Sandy's areas of expertise include business analysis, benchmark interpretation, timing of management events, stocking rates, animal health, and importantly, capital investment analysis into livestock, pasture, and infrastructure. Now with that, I'd like to welcome Sandy to the webinar. Good evening, Sandy. Can you hear us there? I can hear you, Davo. Yep. Thank you, Sandy. So yes. you, um, we can see your screen clearly there, and um, I'll I'll turn off and hear you at the end of the uh, at the end of your session. Okay, great, Davo. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, um, so uh, Dave has asked me to just uh, run through some benchmarks for prime land production. So I just thought I'd start by making sure everyone knows where this, these benchmarks are coming from and where the analysis has been conducted. Um, our benchmarking database primarily comes from southern and eastern New South Wales and uh, each of the little red flags on this map shows each of the 57 specialist prime lamb flocks that were benchmarked in the 15-16 year. And that's pretty representative of our historical data as well. So you can see that it's concentrated in southern and eastern New South Wales, southern Victoria, uh, southern South Australia and Tasmania. Uh, mainly higher rainfall regions, I think the average rainfall across all of those flocks is about 700 millimetres. Um, but obviously there's one or two that fall outside that range. Um, so that those 57 flocks represent 
roughly 170,000 ewes joined last year, um, an average flock size of about 2,500 ewes joined, but up to 20,000 ewes joined. So there's a wide range in size of businesses um, and in, in locations of businesses. So if you're you know, well outside that sort of climate, uh, well outside that sort of resource base, then just, you just have to be careful with some of these benchmarks that I give you uh, as to how applicable they are. In terms of what these benchmarks mean, if we look at the 2015-2016 benchmark results, the uh, profit per DSE, which is how we benchmark uh, all livestock enterprises in particular, so that we can go across rainfall regions and classes of country, etc. The average profit per DSE was $10 a DSE last year. Uh, unfortunately for the prime land producers, they were hardest hit by uh, dry seasons last year, being in those southern regions particularly. When I say last year, I mean 2015 spring. Um, but within that, the 20% 20, 20 of the most profitable producers had an average profit per DSE of $25 a DSE. So the benchmarks I'm talking to tonight are the ones that help make up that difference at two and a half times the average profit between the average of all producers that benchmarked and that 20% most profitable. So it really is focused on how to drive profits out of your prime lamb enterprise. When we look at uh, a business, the, you know, there are three things that matter. It's how much you produce, what it costs you to produce the product, and then what price you get paid for that product. So I'll start with the production benchmarks. Um, and, and note with all these benchmarks that they're all guides to particular parts of the enterprise. Um, some people will get more or less than this benchmark and more or less in other benchmarks um, but and still end up in that top 20%. So it is nearly, um, nearly impossible to hit all of these at any one time when, when we talk to the production and the cost benchmarks. But if you are near all of these benchmarks, over the over the over your whole enterprise, you know, a, slightly above, I hope, on some, and only slightly below on a few. Then, you know, you this is what will set you up for the, a more profitable um, a more profitable business over time. The benchmarks I'm giving you are also based on long-term data, so I'm not looking at any given year, one year, and giving you what happened with the most profitable person in that year because they happened to get above average rainfall when everyone else happened to get below average rainfall. Or they happened to jag a price spike and everyone else you know, sold into the low in the market. So by using longer term data, you know, for at least five years, what we're trying to strip out is that the luck out of the any year's result and get the top performers over time. So starting with the uh, production benchmarks, the key ones that um, we track and record and that I think have the most influence on achieving this top 20% production are listed here below. Um, get a sale weight of, uh, or sorry, a production per hectare, and in this case I've given it to you per 100 mils of rain, so if you're in a 600 mil rainfall zone, then times this 20 by 6, and that's what we'd hope you'd get in uh, dressed weight per hectare for your farm, for, and that's the, over the whole effective area that the, the prime lamb enterprise grazes. So 20 kilograms lamb dressed weight per hectare per 100 mils of rainfall. If your business can achieve that over the long term, some years better, some years slightly below, um, then you are set up for top 20% performance based on these benchmarks. Nine kilograms of lamb dressed weight per DSE, which is effectively 23 kilos of lamb dressed weight per ewe joined, if we want to convert it, or 24 kilos if we want to convert it over to you know a per head measure. Um, one ewe joined per hectare per 100 mil. 
of rainfall. And of all the production benchmarks, this one has uh, the most influence uh, based on our data. So for every 100 mils of rain that, that fall on the property over the course of a 12 month period, we want a stocking rate of one new join per hectare per 100 mils of rainfall. So 600 mil rainfall zone, six years to the hectare joined. 800 mil, eight years to the hectare joined over the total area grazed. 120% lambs wean per year joined is what is what's required. 110% um, won't get you there, 130% isn't necessary. So if you're getting 130% or 140% or 150%, great, but bear in mind that 120% lambs weaned per ewe joined, and that's all ewes joined, including ewe lambs, um, will, get you over the, will get you over the line in terms of required production. And lastly, a growth rate of 280 grams per day from birth to sale. So, and that one of all the benchmarks above um, seems to be the one that we have the most difficulty achieving. 280 grams per day growth rate from the day they hit the ground to the day they are sold. And I'll come back to that benchmark towards the end of this presentation. So they're the key benchmarks on the production side. In terms of costs, um, and I must say that it's usually not costs that make most of the difference between the top 20% and average. However, uh, you know, the, the most profitable producers never lose sight of their costs. and so. Um, you need to keep them under control, and you need, to, and these are the here to guide you as to where people are spending their money and how much they're spending. So, as a per head benchmark, we're looking at about seventy-eight dollars per you joined as your total costs, and that's total operating costs. So it includes animal health treatments, it includes fodder, supplementary feed, it includes your pasture costs. It includes your labour and, uh, and owner labour. And so for people who are owner operators in our benchmarking database, the first labour unit gets allocated $115,000 and every subsequent labour unit or part thereof gets allocated $70,000. It includes depreciation on plant and equipment. Um, it does not include interest costs and it does not include lease costs. So it's basically your operating costs. It doesn't include any costs associated with finance. So $78 per you joined in total operating costs to hit those levels of production we were just talking about. How is that $78 broken down? Well, it's roughly $22 per you in station labour. So that is your owner wages and staff, the people that are there permanently or on a casual basis over the course of the year. It's $14 per you joined in pasture costs, fertilizer, lime, um, chemicals, seed, if you're renovating pastures. It's $7 per you joined in animal health costs, drenches, vaccinations. $9 per you joined in shearing and crutching costs. So that's for your shearers, crutches, shed hands, You've got $9 per you joined, and that includes the cost of crutching lambs and, crutching and shearing lambs if you've got to do that. So um, that goes into that $9. You've got $10 per you joined in selling costs. So to get rid of all her lambs and her wool, uh, you've got $10 to get rid of them. That's in freight, commissions, yard fees, whatever is associated with selling the animal or wool. And then the rest, the fifteen dollars, you know, is for administration, um, for the, you know, accountancy and computers and all the R and M on general R and M, you know, all the other costs in your business. So they should all add up to seventy eight. Those subheadings there that are roughly where they might be apportioned, um, but the important one is the top one. So if you went home with a number and you can't remember 78, go home with 80. If you can keep your costs under $80 per you joined for the year, including your own labour, you're definitely on track to have a cost of production 
uh, capable of matching it with the top 20% prime lamb producers. And that cost of production is around $3.50 per kilo dressed weight or lower. So that's the sort of cost of production, that's where people are able to get their lambs to market at, that's the price point they're able to get their lambs to market at. So everything above that will fall to the bottom line. I've mentioned this already, but just to d show you um, on the left-hand axis, we've got the profit per DSE, and this is from the 15, 16 year, just one year. Um, and then we've got the income per DSE down the bottom. And each of those blue points represents a single flock benchmarked in that, in that year. And you can see there visually, if you look at those, the, that you know, data and the way it's scattered, as you move from left to right, profit goes up from zero up to $40 a DSE. Um, and there's a you know, reasonable trend line through that data. If I was to put up uh, costs per DSE uh, in that same graph, we don't have as clear a trend through the data, it's a bit more scattered. Um, and likewise, if I look at uh, price versus pr price of lamb per DSE versus, or price of lamb per kilo, sorry, and profit per DSE, um, I don't get any relationship. So whilst I mentioned that there are three very important things to influence your profit from a prime lamb production enterprise. Uh, costs, production are very important. Price is important, but what we find is that the price variation within the year doesn't explain much of the variation in profit. So yes, it's important, but actually um, it, it's not the key driver of variation in, in profit between businesses. So what does that say? It says, well, you know, ignore where the premiums in the market are until you've got your production system as efficient as you can get it. After that, worry about how you get rid of your lambs, how to market them, but concentrate on the efficiency of your production system first. <coughs> so income has the greatest influence on profit, and then when we look at what influences income, and in this case I've isolated lamb income per DSE, which is the main driver. Lamb income is 95% of total income, uh, so it's the main driver of total income. And we look at what the main influence on income is, it is this production or kilograms of lamb dressed weight per DSE. So on that bottom axis, um, it shows the variation in that year in production from two kilograms of lamb per DSE up to 14 kilograms of lamb per DSE, and how that influences lamb income per DSE from $10 up to $80 per DSE. So um, if we want to think about how to influence our income, it is clear, you know, graphs like this make it clear that thinking about the production first and foremost is the most important aspect of it. So if, if production per DSE, kilograms of lamb per DSE, which is really just another way of saying how many kilograms of lamb do I produce per kilogram of grass harvested, then we need to think about what the main drivers of that are. And there are th three key drivers of kilograms of lamb weaned, uh, kilograms of lamb produced per DSE, and that is the number of lambs weaned per year joined, which seems obvious, the sale weight of those lambs, um, and then also, less obvious, the growth rate to sale. And so this is a really important one and one that uh, we feel is most often overlooked in terms of people thinking about their production system. Lots of people can tell us uh, how many lambs wean per ewe joined. Um, uh, a lot of people can tell us what the sale weight of those lambs were, but when we ask them what the growth rate to sale was, that's something that they haven't considered, and so they have to go back and work that out. But it is very important, as I'll demonstrate here in a minute. <laughs> if you look at those individually and look at their influence on production per DSE, um, a bit like price, if we look at lambs weaned per ewe joined, and this is all lambs weaned from all ewes joined, so it includes ewe lambs if you're in a self-replacing system. 
Um, again, what we see is that there's no real picture in that data. You know, there's no real trend line. It's quite flat. If I put a trend line through that data, it would be flat, and it actually wouldn't explain much variation there. And so that's not telling us that lambs wean per you join is not important. What it's telling us is there's something else that's having a bigger influence on the variation than this one. So someone with 100% lambs weaned per ewe joined can get you know near 10, 10 plus kilos of lamb per DSC, which we know is enough. Um, and people, some people who are getting 140% lambs weaned per ewe joined aren't getting any more than 10 kilograms of lamb per DSC. So just because you've got a higher lambing percentage doesn't mean you've been more productive per DSE. And so that's important to understand because you know the, the single most popular key performance indicator that's banding around the industry is a lamb's wean per ewe join. Um, but it actually, you know, if you only concentrate on that, you can be missing out on actually the key objective, which is your production per hectare. So um, it's important, and I'm not saying it's not, but if you focus on it singularly, uh, it's no guarantee that you'll end up where you want to be. If we move on to growth rate to sale, and again, it's not perfect, but if you look at that graph, we've got, um, actually the axis title is wrong, it should be uh, growth rate to sale in grams per day. So we've got from 100 grams per day up to roughly 250 grams per day against production kilograms of lamb dressed weight per DSE. So if we look at that graph, I can see that, um, you know, visually there's a bit of a trend through there as my lambs wean per ewe joined goes up, uh, sorry, as my production growth rate to sale goes up in grams per day from 100 to 250, there's a bit of a trend there to have increased dress weight per DSE. Again, like lambs wound per you joined, it's not perfect, but it actually has a stronger trend uh, in the data set than lambs wound per you joined. Probably alarming to most is that where the average actually comes out. So in the 15, 16 year, we've averaged from roughly 125 grams per day from birth to sale up to 250 grams of lamb from birth to sale. And the big question is, where is the 400 grams per day from lambing to sale, you know, or the 300 grams per day? Those are often benchmarks that are put out into the industry as you know, what your lamb should be doing. But as an industry, we are missing that, but those benchmarks by a long way. So this is, an I think, I feel, a very important KPI and one we need to get focused on to improve, again, production and profits from our prime lamb enterprises. Uh, there are a lot of people who are still well, well, well below what should be achievable in terms of growth rate to sale. The interesting uh, analysis that comes out of looking at that in the data is if you look at the slaughter month, so the month the lambs are sold to, and to be fair, not all of them are to slaughter necessarily. Some might go as store lambs, but their month they're sold against their growth rate to that date. So we take their birth, the month of birth, to the month of, of, of sale, and we look at how many grams per day they've done uh, in, in the, over that period, and we do that for every month and for every producer. What you see there in front of you is the average growth rate per day to hit those months. And there's a clear trend there that the lowest average growth rates to uh, sale come from lambs that are sold through late autumn and early, and early and mid winter. The highest uh, growth rate to sale lambs come from the lambs that are sold towards the end of spring, October, November, December. But essentially what this graph is telling us is once we get outside our key growing season, our main growing season in the spring, remembering where this data is coming from when you, when you remember back to that map, is as soon as we go past our spring, 
our average growth rates to sales start to plummet. And that makes a bit of sense because a couple of things happen. The quality of our pastures start declining and so growth rates fall away. And also often lambs are put on hold for a period of time until a fodder crop can be, get, can be grown to then put them back onto. So we go through periods you know, where they're doing nothing um, before they get onto that high value feed to get them to their sale weight at, at, at you know, late autumn or winter. But that period of doing nothing while they're getting there is, uh, is, is really important and it really hampers this average growth rate to sale. And then if we go back a step, that hampers uh, the kilograms of lamb produced per DSE. And if we go back another step, that starts to hamper the income we can generate per DSE out of the flock, which is a key influence on our profits. So thinking about how you set your production system up to best utilise the best growing season you have where you have the highest quantity of highest value feed on hand and that is usually the spring is a key consideration when you're setting up your prime lamb enterprise. If you can set it up to be doing most of your lamb growth in that spring period um, then you will Ease, meet your growth rate to sale targets a lot easier than if you are setting the system up to be outside that period. Now unfortunately, but not coincidentally, that sort of production system coincides with the, with the low in the market. Um, but what our data is suggesting is that low in the market is, uh, is and the impact it has on your cost of production is far greater than the discounts you will receive from targeting that market. So, um, so that is a key consideration when setting up your production system. How much of my, the time from growth to slaughter, and it's, it's you know, effectively from birth to slaughter, we're talking five months at least usually, how much of that time will be sitting inside that great spring pasture growth period where the, the where the feed is cheap, high quality, and I can maximise those growth rates. <clears throat> so just to recap um, and, and, and summarise, I guess, if I had to pick only four key prime land benchmarks to get in the 20% most profitable, these are the four I would pick. I would try and set my system up so that I could have one new joined per hectare per 100 mils of rainfall over the course of the year. I would be targeting an average of 24 kilograms dress weight per ewe uh, from, from each ewe joined, but I would get that by 120% lambs at, with a target market of 20 kilograms carcass weight. Because I think, well, my feeling is to go to 24, I push too far out of that peak growing season. Um, I would be targeting at least 250 grams per day growth rate to sale. I would hope I can get over 300 if I can get my system, my genetics and everything in order and get it focused on that key pasture period. And I would be trying to control my cost to be under $78 per year joined in total operating expenses. So that's it from me. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Andy. Great presentation and I'll give you a rest there for a minute or two while we just um, remind everyone that the post-webinar survey will pop up once you close the webinar platform or we shut it uh, down on you. So please take a moment just to leave your thoughts, um, any recommendations um, to improve the webinar series. We do take them on board and and uh, when there's a, a you know a, a collective weight behind one recommendation, well, we definitely act on that. Another thing to remember is that our next Making More from Sheep webinar on ram uh, simplifying ram selection through the use of ASPVs and indices and um, commercially available ram benchmarking tools is not actually next week; it's the following week. So we're going to take one break away from the webinars for and come back in a fortnight's time on Wednesday evening again at 8 p.m. At that time it'll be uh, at a standard time, not daylight savings time. And Lou Hogan of the Sheep CRC will be delivering that webinar. 
So RAM selection, um, simplifying RAM selection in two weeks time on April the 12th at 8 p.m. There's a few questions coming through here. Sandy's uh, kindly offered to stick around for as long as we need to answer whatever questions that you may have that are relevant to your business. This is the key benefit of attending the webinars because if you've got something in burning inside that you want to get off your chest, then this is the best opportunity to do it. And we don't always have uh, the high caliber speakers like Sandy and, and the other presenters in the Making More From Cheap webinar series um, at our disposal. So this is a great opportunity. And there's a few questions coming through there and there's a few rain reports. Thank you for that. Things are looking up. There's a good break in a lot of areas. Sandy, I might kick off with a question here from uh, Matthew uh, from South Australia. Now Matthew asks, well, what fodder crops do you suggest for lambs to fill the feed gap in summer? And maybe standing oat crop or fodder crop or do you rely on grain? Uh, the answer to that, Matthew, I think most people over summer are probably using brassicas now um, rather than, um, you know, where you, where you have uh, reliable springs and some summer rain, I think brassicas are probably the dominant fodder crop. Uh, where the summer rains, you know, where it's too hot and too dry, yes, then it's typically grain. Um, but I, I would say... Uh, in answer to that too is that a lot of people, well sorry not a lot of people, um, you know if I was to advise you I'd be saying um, I'd want most of my lambs off before that summer period came and so I'd be hoping that they were off through the growing season so I'd set my lambing date early enough to get them off before the summer arrived and then um, try and get them you know gone or most of them at least gone before that summer comes. But the ones that are left, um, brassicas seem to be the most popular in the higher rainfall regions, um, but then grain feeding, you know, in, in uh, feedlots and things seems to be the most popular in the drier regions. Great, thanks Andy. So Andy, a question here from Joe. Joe asks, is there breed influence? No, there's, n no, there's not. So in this database we've got first cross ewes, composite ewes, you know, Coopworth ewes, all sorts of breeds in there um, and no, I don't think, um, you know, we could say that there's any one breed that you, you are, is required for to meet these targets. I would say though is that um, you've got to be cognizant of your growth in that whatever breed you use and, you know, we've been very focused on fertility for a long period of time. Um, but we, you can't let the side of you know the growth end of the equation, and so people who are running first cross ewes, one of the advantages they've got is that every ewe joined is to a terminal side, you know, a Dorset or a White Suffolk, where all they're bred for is their growth, um, and so we can't lose sight of that. Um, and obviously, that's all within the meeting market specifications limitations. But um, no, there's no breed. Um, that I'd say you you need to have, um, but avoid you know you got you got to watch frame and um, make sure your your sheep aren't too small so that they don't hit those growth rate targets. Perfect, thanks, Andy. Sandy uh, James has got a comment leading a question here. Um, a fixation on growth rates has led to eating quality issues in the pork industry. Has the lamb industry done enough to avoid spoiling the product? Uh, James, I'm not sure yet, um, and I'm and I'm um, and I, I have no doubt if we push growth only for too long, we would hit the same problem. Um, but the question is, should we not pursue it um, in in you know anticipation that that might happen? And if you look at you know who's who's gained the most market share over the last um, you know 50 years in the meat industry. It's you know chicken and pork, and because they've managed to uh, drive down or drive up their efficiencies, drive down their cost of production, um, and so even though they hit the wall in terms of how much more they could push it, I don't think they made a mistake by getting there as quickly as they could. So we want to be we want to watch it. 
and we want to make sure that when we get there we know and we can stop before we go too far but I suspect we're a long way off it yet and I think that um, in the meantime uh, my advice would be to keep pursuing it. Right, yeah, spot on. Thank you, Sandy. Sandy, a question here from Matthew. Matthew asks, are the Flox benchmarked first cross used to terminal size? Yeah, Matthew, some are. Um, I don't have the exact proportion in front of me right now, but um, you know, if, if I had to guess, I'd say about 40, 35, 40% 40 of them are first cross used with terminal size. Um, they are now, the database is now dominated by self-replacing flocks, which is mainly your Coopworths and your composites. Um, so, but there is still a substantial number of first cross used in that, in that uh, database. Right, yeah, thanks Andy. Sandy, a question here from John. Does spring lambing give best growth rates in Tassie? No, I don't think it does, uh, unfortunately. So the problem with the spring lambing in Tassie is that um, we, you know we, the lambs aren't ready for sale before we've hit the summer and the autumn. And whilst there's a lot of irrigation in Tassie, um, you know that that period where you're waiting for your spring crops and summer crops to be harvested and then your autumn feed to come on to put those lambs onto after weaning is something that holds back your growth rate through that period of time and it's very tricky to manage that. So um, typically the easiest way is to have a winter lambing system where they're turned off at the end of spring um, but there are people who do manage it, you know, they have the crop rotations and the systems in place to uh, make it work. Uh, I just feel it's a trickier system to get to, to get right. Okay, thanks Andy. So any question from Scott, uh, Scott asks, where in cost production do we account for you replacement costs? Uh, yep, good question. That um, if, if you are buying in ewes, those ewes get, at, the, the cost of those ewes gets added to your uh, costs in, for your cost of production. So the, uh, we, in, we add the value of the ewe or the, you know, that, the net trade between you use. So you might be selling Casper age use at $100 but buying in young use at $150 or $200. That $100 loss per you um, goes on goes on to your total costs in your cost of production. Thanks Sandy. Sandy, a question from Joe. Sandy, to work out growth rate to sale do you work on average birth weight or do you recommend EID tags and weighing at landmarking? No, look, all I'm recommending is using the average um, birth birth weight. So, you know, get an idea for what your average birth weights are and just using that. I don't think, you know, whether we are 230 grams per day or 240 grams per day is neither here nor there. Whether we are 150 grams per day or 250 grams per day is is the answer we're trying to achieve, uh, you know, get it, get our heads around. So I don't think we need to go to a lot of trouble to work it out. Um, get an idea of your average birth weights um, and know your weights at sale and your dates at sale. And you can use an average birth date, you know, maybe the end of the first cycle to get your, to get your estimate. So it doesn't have to be deadly accurate and I don't think we need the EID to get it. Perfect. Thanks, Andy. Sandy, a question from Matthew in South Australia again. Is there a correlation on kilograms per hectare for separating ewes for triplets, uh, uh, i.e. under 60 ewes as a mob, twins and under 120 ewes in a mob and singles at 250 and only? And I, I'm just uh, interpreting that. I, I suggest that Matt's talking about uh, separating ewes for lambing, I suspect. Yeah, look, I, I'm not, I don't think um, all of that is a magic bullet to it. I think the systems of, you know, what production system you set up is far more important. So the, you know, your lambing date, target market, um, stocking rate, I think they're the, they're the key drivers. How you best manage that, it, I think, is up to you. So if you scan and separate, and, you know, and you've got the paddocks to do it, um, and the 
you know, the time to manage it and get it all done, that's fine. And I think, you know, if you've got all that and it, and it helps, absolutely pursue it. Um, but if you are limited in resources to be able to do that, um, that's not that's not going to stop you from achieving these benchmarks. And so that's important to keep in mind. You don't have to have all that to get to these benchmarks. Um, if you're lucky enough to be able to, sure, go for your life. But it's not a barrier to getting the benchmarks I'm mentioning tonight. Thanks, Andy. Sandy, uh, a different Matthew, a different Matthew, asks, are uh, feed costs factored into costs per U, or do most profitable flocks have minimal feed costs? <laughs> no, I mean, it changes all the time with seasons, um, but yes, the feed costs are factored into your cost of production, so if you've got to buy in grain, that goes against the, and it's fed to the prime lamb flock, that goes onto your costs. Um, in our benchmarking, if you put those uh, prime lamb ewes or lambs onto a fodder crop, they have to pay to be there. So you either uh, they either pay an adjustment rate, or you may allocate a value. You know, you might say, well, they have to pay half their weight gain on that crop to to use it. So all supplementary feed, adjustment, supplementary feed, and use of fodder crops comes at a cost, and that goes on to the cost of production. In, in this case. Great, thanks Sandy. Sandy, I'll just give you a quick rest there for a second. We're maintaining fairly good interest. We, we've only lost about two or three people from the webinar throughout the questions, so that's a really good sign that everyone's keen on the, um, keen on the questions and keen on the answers. Uh, so with that in mind, if anyone has some more questions to ask, please don't be, um, don't be afraid, drop them in the questions box there and We'll get them dealt with towards the uh, towards the end of the question time, and don't forget in a fortnight's time we've got that uh, simplifying rams uh, webinar uh, same evening Wednesday evening at eight p.m. and um, one more plug on the web survey if you get the chance to do that on the on your way out this evening be much appreciated. Sandy, a question here from Joe again. Joe's got a pretty good question. Um, autumn lambing is still favoured in many areas. Will these enterprises struggle to reach the benchmarks? Yeah, I think um, the, the main issue with the autumn lambing and hitting your benchmarks is on the used join per hectare per 100 mils of rainfall. So autumn lambing, obviously, once the lambs are on the ground and, you know, the growing season started, then, you know, that, that, that's... Uh, that's perfect from then on because you've got the lamb on the ground already, uh, the feed in front of them, it's all high quality feed and they're going to easily meet their target weights by, before that feed at the end of the season. The main constraint comes with hitting that how many ewes I can run per hectare per 100 mils of rain I'm going to get. So um, the, the shorter your growing season, and that means the lower your rainfall, the earlier you are pushed into um, lambing because if your season cuts off in October or you've got lots of grass seed in October and you've got to have those lambs off before that date um, then you are forced to be you know early winter at the latest to hit that so um, but as that growing season gets shorter and shorter it gets harder to hit that one ewe per hectare per 100 mils and as it gets harder to hit that one ewe per hectare per 100 mils it gets harder to hit that kilograms of lamb per hectare benchmark. So, yes, I wouldn't. If I had the length of growing season, I definitely wouldn't lamb in the autumn. As my season gets shorter, I'm getting, going to get pushed towards it. Um, but um, you know, I'm, I've got to do that understanding that that I mightn't hit that benchmark. And as I said at the start of the uh, webinar, if you are in a really low rainfall area with a really short growing season. We've got to be very careful that we extrapolate the benchmarks that I'm giving you tonight, which you know really range from about 450 mils upwards. Um, we've got to be careful not to just throw them at lower rainfall regions, pastoral regions, and say this is what you should do. Great, thanks, Sandy. Sandy, uh, Dan, uh, Dan is from down the Holbrook way there. He asked questions. So, are you suggesting a August one lambing? Well, it's going, it, it's going to vary with um, you know, everyone's different 
growing seasons and rainfall. But uh, at Holbrook, I would think it's going to be more like July, sometime in July, to have them off, you know, in uh, in November, December, um, before the end of the season there. I think August would be just pushing a bit too late at Holbrook if you were trying to get them off by then. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks, Andy. So, Andy, that, um, that actually wraps up all the questions. So... Uh, look, there's still an opportunity there to ask a question. If anyone's got one, just drop it in there. But um, we'll start wrapping it up. I'd like to thank you, Sandy, for presenting on behalf of Making More From Sheep. And I think that uh, you can't get much feedback from the webinar platform, but uh, I dare say there'd be a collective thank you from the audience as well. And um, I'd like to thank the audience for attending and supporting the Making More From Sheep summer webinar series. It's on the back of the participation that we're able to secure the funding to to keep the series going. So thank you for that. And um, yeah, so there's no more questions, Sandy. So, oh, yep, no more questions there. And um, uh, yeah, we'll, we might sign off for the evening. All good. Okay, well, thank you, Sandy. And thank you, thank you to the audience and uh, looking forward to seeing everyone in a fortnight's time at the Simplifying Ram Selection webinar. I'll send you out some details on that closer to the date and um, I'll see you there. Have a good evening.